So, welcome to our uh, last control seminar before winter break. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce someone I had just met this time, one of our newest colleagues in Michigan, Hugo Villasante. Yep. And he comes here from uh, Ohio State, the mechanical engineering department, and he's going to tell us about equitable, equitable dynamic systems engineering. Right. Okay. Thank you very much, Sima. Uh, hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Hope you guys hear me well. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I started at mechanical engineering at the University of Michigan this year. Um, so, I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here. I came to present the plan and vision that I have for my research program, right? Which has to do, as the title says, on dynamic systems and control and also on the social aspects uh, of ethics, in particular equity, right? And how they intersect um, with the hope that we can have a discussion um, at the end uh, of this presentation, right? So jump in. Uh, so the topic uh, is on cyber physical social systems, right? It might be a long term, but um, it, it's uh, I take it as a synonym to other terms that are present in literature, like socio-technical system or techno-social system, socio-technological system. In either case, we have a cyber domain, computation, communication, control, autonomy, uh, interacting with the physical domain and also with the social domain. Right, people interacting with people and with these other domains. Um, so I chose this term to highlight that, right? That highlight that humans interacting there are not just sensors in, in this network that we can picture, but they are main actors, right? And uh, I view technology as a way to enhance these interactions between humans, right? And you see there are a list of uh, domains where this uh, term is present, um, but this is also, I mean, not, uh, I mean, there are other domains that are not present. I just put a list there as an example. Um, so, um, so, to design the systems, uh, Right now, I mean, there are some considerations we might take into account when we're dealing with human or social domains, right? And that uh, we can view that it within the scope of ethics, right? We have privacy challenges, right? When we have humans that they have right to privacy and other human rights, um, we must preserve them. Of course, many people here are working on safety in these domains. Um, transparency, uh, it's crucial to build trust between cyber and the social domain. Um, autonomy is a very big concept, and but in terms of ethics here, it appears in two ways. Uh, one way is uh, the, the role of autonomy with respect to shifting jobs, right? People losing jobs and the need to adapt to that from the society, right? But also autonomy plays a role in terms of how do we define who controls whom, right? Is it, when do we define when the human controls the system or when the system takes over, right, and controls the system, uh, when, when an autonomous agent controls the system, right? It also has ethical considerations. The, the, the one that I'm mostly interested here is on equity. Right, um, many, 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 many definitions there. I like to view them as equality of opportunities, right? Leaving no one behind, um, making sure everybody has the capabilities of achieving their goals and fulfilling and lead a fulfilling lives, right? Uh, so this is that's the main or main concept that, and I'm that I'm gonna to present today throughout the applications of my previous work. So of course, to tackle some of these challenges, um, 
us in particular from dynamic systems and in, in the dynamic systems and control field, right? We can contribute by solving some of these challenges in particular. They're modeling the social domain and their interaction with the cyber and the physical is not a trivial matter yet, right? In, I mean, in part because humans, I, uh, we are diverse, we are socially influenced, we are biased, we, we make mistakes, right? But we also are strategic, right? We are goal-driven, we, we are adaptive, we learn and adapt, right? And, and we have agency, we have an agency of changing things based on these strategies and adaptations, right? Um, and this is, ex I mean, this is relevant in particular for systems where, uh, we cannot expect the law of large numbers to, you know, cancel out or average out the, the diversity, right? Like in, in smaller systems where we truly cannot uh, average out this diversity. Um, data availability to estimate some of these dynamic models, uh, which are the main tool for using the uh, analysis and control tools. Um, is scarce. It's scarce in particular for certain systems that uh, that are that when systems that are involved when we're trying to solve problems of equity, like underprivileged settings, where we don't have the data we need uh, oftentimes to estimate our dynamical uh, differential equation, for instance, right? Um, and to complicate again a little bit more. Um, the foundation, the social physics, right? That oftentimes we use physics to build models from first principle, for instance, right? That part's not yet well developed in the social domain, right? Not as much as, for instance, biology or chemistry. Um, so we have to deal with that uh, additional challenge, right? As I mentioned, I mean, besides modeling, Equity, as I defined before, right, can also be viewed as the resource, the problem of allocating these resources in a fair way such that everybody has a shot, right? Everybody has, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, it, disregarding the, uh, or independent of the diversity or uh, the needs, right? Everybody should be included. Everybody should have a voice when taking into account this resource allocation questions, right? Um, something that uh, if we have a model, we can start asking deeper questions in the context of dynamical systems and social systems. Um, the people working in artificial intelligence and machine learning are quite ahead of us in these discussions, right? Um, in particular, the AI alignment community, right? They are very active uh, on exploring philosophy, ethics, and in the social domain and the interaction with artificial intelligence, machine learning. Um, so we, we must have more of these discussions in particular to respond to the fast pace of technological advance, right? Um, we must have, in when we're building cyber physical social systems, we must, we must take into account that we must design it such that it adapts quickly to this fast pace, right? And that's something that we are good at, right? Designing systems that can adapt or reject disturbances such that maintain some desired configuration. Uh, so we're gonna explore more on that in this lecture. One such example of a cyber physical social systems that I want to present here in the context of education, in particular, early childhood education, right? So this is a, this is a social system, right? We have little kids there. They are diverse. They have their unique needs. And they, they are in this environment that hopes to foster learning, right? So this learning happening as these kids interact between themselves, between, with the environment, with teachers, and so on. 
So uh, that's, uh, I want to highlight again, the role of the interactions, right? Scientists in the education psychology domain have identified that kids learn faster through peer-to-peer -peer interaction, right? In particular, in the language domain, they learn language more through these interactions, right? Than, for instance, in, uh, interactions with adults. Uh, so it, it is uh, in terms of time spent, uh, accounting for time spent. So, uh, however, there, scientists have also seen that these interactions or these opportunities to interact are not well distributed. Right. So in kids that have uh, unique needs, right, we found that they are sometimes isolated from the social network that builds in this classroom. Uh, so they, they are not accessing to those resources to learn, right? So the scientists want to know more about that. Uh, so they engage uh, in the scientific method with a scientific method to learn more, to see what can we do, right? How can we support teachers and the kids themselves so that everybody has a shot, right? Typically, uh, we see I highlighted there, right? They engage in observations because some of the variables they are interested in are highly qualitative, right? So the 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 issue with that is that um, it's very expensive. It's very expensive to collect a lot of data needed to truly generalize knowledge across classrooms, across settings, right? So uh, the hope is there that we can provide wearable sensors, just like this one here, uh, to enhance human observations, right? And to increase the temporal resolution of the data that we can collect. I mean, the hope is that these sensors are sufficiently uh, non-invasive, so they can continue uh, learning throughout their day, right? So this one in particular has is, is a Bluetooth beacon, they can detect, um, uh, they, they exchange packages, right? And they, they, so the RSSI, the signal strength is recorded when, when, when two kids have these sensors in, in their chest, for instance, right? Uh, there are other configurations. You can have RFID sensors and so on, right? So this could also, this also has uh, a voice recorder. So we can collect audio that we could later use uh, automatic speech recognition, natural language processing, to analyze or try to get some ideas of what, what are they saying, how much are they exchanging, what type of messages are they exchanging, right? Uh, it, at the end, when we we're trying to come up with an ethical way to collect the data we need to estimate, for instance, uh, a dynamical model to be a Bayesian uh, dynamical network uh, a dynamical model that will capture some of the dynamics that we're interested in, for instance, learning dynamics right throughout. I mean, we can uh, scientists can detect through the their instruments, like little tests that they give the kids. They can detect changes in language every three months. Right? That's the smallest temporal resolution that they can, right? The hope is that the, with this type of sensors, we can do it faster. But Nevertheless, it's lower dynamics that we are used to. Uh, but we can, uh, if we have the sufficient data, estimate such models. And again, th th those models will allow us to um, analyze it, the system, provide, provide, for instance, stakeholders, parents, teachers, school administrators. Right? This, is, this is how the classroom looks like. This is the model. right? Uh, can uh, how do we define what's ethical or what's equitable here? How do we group it, right? It's far, I mean, we that, such, you can think about it as like a very, very basic digital twin of this classroom interactions, right? And maybe test some of the solutions that we can come up and foster these discussions. Um, those models can also serve to uh, design uh, interventions, programs, or automate elements of the environment, have uh, 
embodied agents like robots there also interacting with kids, right? Uh, robots that can train and learn which type of interactions are more powerful for learning, right? We can give the main, the main actuator of the system, for a lack of a better term, the teachers, right? We can give them information of where this, how the system is looking, right? So they can act upon that information. Right, so uh, so this example highlights some of those challenges um, that I presented earlier. So the work that I'll be doing here uh, has to do with building tools that are based in systems and control to design and implement a cyber cyber physical systems that are equitable, right? That that are aware of when there are imbalances in the distribution of resources and act, right? Sometimes automatically or through people to restore equity, right? So the, I've, I've um, I, uh, my, my previous work was in the field of, I mean, in the subfield of stability of multi-agent systems, right? Some of you might work on that. So that's my home in terms of systems and control. Uh, but I also draw and contribute to computational social science, which is a field where they are tasked to build mathematical or computational models of this social phenomena, right? Use, uh, using data-driven models. Um, and, and they appear in, in economics, sociology, uh, psychology, et cetera. And also from the literature on alignment and, and, and ethics, right? That it's, as I mentioned, it's very active in artificial intelligence, but has its roots in philosophy and also other humanities. Um, so I take, I mean, I view myself within this, um, within this diagram in the intersection, right? And using uh, artificial intelligence to implement some of these, um, systems. So today I'm going to present uh, some applications that uh, I work with uh, throughout this, the standard uh, steps on closing the loop on typical dynamical systems, right? I'm going to present efforts on modeling these uh, dynamical systems uh, uh, that are guided by social theory whenever available or with data uh, also whenever available. Um, those models can be used for analyzing, right? To analyze what's the behavior of the system and how do we characterize equity with respect to optimality, stability, and robustness. Um, the design part has to do with design a an intervention like a controller. How do we how do we react to a systems uh, through disturbances to the system, right? Um, and another important element to design here are the uh, human subjects experiments. Right? Uh, it's difficult to do system identification when we cannot do all the experiments that we want. Right, because it's not ethical or it's not feasible, right? So that calls for a different sets of tools um, to be able to estimate some of these models. And it, so care has to be taken into designing the experiments, the data collection. Uh, implementation, as I mentioned, through AI for sensing and actuation. And after that data comes in, we can re-engage in this, improve our models, improve our analysis and so on. Okay, um, so let me ground that a little bit. I'm gonna go, uh, I have to disclaim that I'm gonna go rather fast over some of these applications, uh, but uh, I'm happy to chat afterwards um, if you wanna go, if you wanna discuss it a little bit uh, in depth, how these, uh, for instance, the math or which methods I used in some of these applications, which will have to do with, um, Alcohol abuse, um, resilient 
cooperation in low-income settings, mental health, and early childhood education uh, towards the end. So we'll start with uh, alcohol abuse. Um, uh, this is a, a problem that is pervasive across socioeconomic uh, levels, right? Third, uh, almost 14% of, 40 of all the deaths uh, of people younger than 40 years old has to do with alcohol here in the United States. Um, so it's, uh, but the, the, the consequences of alcohol abuse are not equally distributed, right? People without safety nets uh, are usually hit the most by this type of uh, issues, right? And um, something that scientists have recognized is that behaviors like risky drinking behaviors are influenced by peers, for instance, right? So how can we use the power of social influence to reduce the chances of engaging in risky drinking behaviors, which could lead to people driving drunk and so on? Uh, so we could leverage technology like this one, mobile phones or uh, wearable sensors, right? in what uh, the social scientists call just-in-time adaptive interventions, like GTI, to react to that and reduce drinking behavior. So I'm going to focus on uh, drinking events, which events like parties, where you go, you go with a group, you start drinking, you engage in, uh, 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 you might not be aware, but you are influenced by your peers and, uh, what are the dynamics that happen there, right? So this uh, work uh, was in collaboration with uh, Professor John Clapp from the College of Social Work at the Ohio State University. So um, to model a drinking event, like I mentioned, right? There are several levels, right? We can start from the physiology of alcohol. How do the body metabolizes alcohol, right? How that affects decision-making and self-regulation. We're going to cognitive models, right? Then how do, how do this, uh, uh, our social connections influence that decision-making, right? We're going to social learning theory. Um, and how do we intervene? How do we model such an intervention like uh, a friend getting a text, hey, your, your friend's getting drunk, take care of him, watch out. Or we have a party monitor, for instance, right? Getting some uh, information about the state of the system uh, in terms of in alcohol intoxication. So the, the, of course, I mean, as engineers, we engage first in uh, deriving a, a multi-agent system uh, governed by differential equations, having incorporating all these terms over there, right? But it was really hard to communicate with our colleagues, right? So we had to translate a di this dynamical system into this language that they were able to understand and we were able to communicate, right? This is a stocks and flow diagram. It's popular in the field of, they call it system dynamics in social science. Very, very similar to simulating, right? But no, seriously, I, 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 that was my first try. It's actually, okay, you got this, let's put it in the simulating. No, right? I put it in this way. Oh, yeah, this is the stock. It's an integrator, right? And this is the flow, right? So stocks and flow. Like, it's very easy to see the analogy of hydraulical systems there, right? Um, that helped a lot, and we were able to uh, publish uh, several papers on this topic, right? Some, some of the things we learned uh, through simulations and through stability and controllability analysis, right? Is that, uh, for instance, uh, the social influence, I mean, there, there's the stability theory. Again, I, I will omit the details, but the social influence can be good or bad, depending on how your group is, the characteristics of your group, right? Um, then we, uh, we analyze controllability, right? In, in terms of, okay, we have this network, we have 
This is a group of peers drinking. This is the other group of peers. The edges represent how the, the weights of the influence between each other. Um, if, if, if we had to choose to intervene on one or the whole network, I mean, what, how do we do it? Which one do we choose? Right? And we found that um, going through, uh, trying to change the behavior of influential or isolated or stubborn individuals, right, will result in better controllability result, uh, well, will achieve better controllability of the whole system. Right? And through computational analysis, uh, computing the controllability degree in a Monte Carlo simulation, right? Uh, we see that targeting these individuals is better. I mean, it achieves higher controllability degree, which is a proxy for control energy in the system. I mean, uh, 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 spent in the system. So we have a higher controllability degree than random selection. Uh, okay, so um, the, the, the model was estimated with data that my collaborator had. So the hope is that to, to use this lessons from a control theoretic analysis to design these interventions that I mentioned before. Um, another domain uh, that I was interested in was in financial decisions in low income settings, right? So you all know it's it's um, it's a hard problem to make these decisions when you are constrained. You have you're under a lot of risks of let's say um, if you're a farmer, you are uh, uh, subject to uh, weather, you're subject to death of a relative or weddings sometimes weddings are a big thing right uh, or a big social impact uh so all of this um the, 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 throughout the world different uh, similar forms of cooperation emerges right and i was interested in, in understanding how can through mathematical model we, we understand why this similar this similar cooperation uh, strategies appear in different parts of the world that may not have contact, right? So the, the work over there, I mean, use work in uh, finance, right? For uh, maximizing portfolio allocation, right? It's a standard problem, right? Uh, we augmented it with adding human and uh, like education and health capital. So the people in this model had to invest in whatever their, let's say in a farm, right? Whatever the source of income is. They also had to invest in education for their families, health of their families, because they all had through this um, equation here from uh, economics, right? Health and education increases the return on your investments. Um, all that, again, this is a stochastic model subject to these uncertainties that I mentioned. Uh, subject also to this budgetary constraints, right? And trying to maximize some uh, goal, uh, some goals of achieving a desired, a, a desired way of living that people may have, right? So uh, I conceptualize this as a model, nonlinear model predictive control uh, to see how well can an MPC solved this problem, right? And it, it, as expected in, in that graph over there, we see that it's sometimes depending on the initial capital people have in, 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 in on the whatever financial or business environment they are, it's often, I mean, in, in this yellow region here, it's not feasible to escape poverty, right? As mentioned by this under-resourced rate is like a bankruptcy. There's no feasible solution. Um, so this type of behavior has been present throughout uh, development, econ development economics literature, the poverty trap. And it, it's clear that some people, no matter how intelligent or no matter how optimal their behavior is, 
it's often unfeasible to get out of that, right? So that's where the need for cooperation emerges, right? Two types of cooperation that, that I was interested in that I was able to simulate, right? One is the savings club, right? When people pool their money and then they decide to share that pool of money depending on certain rules, like someone needs the money, someone is sick and so on. Um, again, appearing in several parts of the world, right? What we see there is that not all the savings clouds are optimal, right? If there are savings clouds that are too, that, that, that require too much of the people, like in this case, right? The monthly contribution that people have to make to belong to that pool is too high then the performance as measured by community development index, which is an index that's inspired in the human development index uh, used by the World Bank and others that captures, that aggregates in a nonlinear function, the financial health, health and education. Um, so what we learned there is that, okay, savings clubs are good when we have to optimize them. Uh, so others donation strategy, these are a more decentralized strategy where people donate their money according to what they feel, I mean, their neighbors need or based on some uh, reputation, for instance, right? or, or, or so based on the social connections that you may have, right? So what we see in this simulations, again, this is the under resource rate. One means that people are getting bankrupt and zero here in blue means that people are doing well. So uh, we see that in, for instance, these people that are very well connected are doing well throughout these Monte Carlo simulations where these people that have very few connections are oftentimes having a hard time escaping poverty. Um, so uh, in conclusion, I mean, cooperation works, but it has to be uh, tailored. There's not a one size fit all solution. Um, so this, this work is being actually implemented now in Colombia and Paraguay with some, um, we're, we're, we're uh, collecting data from savings club to try to calibrate these models and improve on them such that hopefully in the future we can have uh, coaches like artificial coaches in their cell phone right, providing suggestions on how to manage a savings club or how to manage these more decentralized donation strategies. Um, another domain that uh, I was interested in is on mental health, right, in particular mood disorders. Um, uh, you may be aware that it's, it's um, affecting a lot of people, we're talking about depression and bipolar disorder. Um, uh, so again, it's affecting uh, people throughout socioeconomic status, but people without the appropriate safety nets are under, are under the, uh, more stressors, right? Which can trigger some of these um, uh, episodes of depression and mania. Um, and also people in low income settings or, or underprivileged settings, they have, uh, they lack access to the right care for mental health. Um, so how, how can systems and control assist there? And, and I, I identified many, 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 many uh, avenues, but these two over there, psychoeducation and Closed loop sensory stimulation. I, I feel like those are the ones that the applications are uh, would be rather uh, feasible, right? In particular, the psychoeducation one, which simply, I mean, it's not simple, but it's highly effective, for instance, for bipolar disorder, right? It's simply teaching them what is bipolar disorder, what are the triggers, uh, what are the dynamics of the mood, right? How mood goes from a depressive mood to a manic mood and so on, right? So the, uh, all, all the literature in bipolar disorder, right? Talk about multi-stability. So having, uh, in a plane where you have 
these two moods, right? Depressive and manic, these represent severity of symptoms, right? And psychologists have scales with which can they can measure how depressive or how manic, right? If you're unfamiliar, manic is a state of high energy, excitement, right? Um, whereas depression is, a, you can conceptualize as a, as a state of low energy, sadness. Um, and in the bipolar disorder, they talk about multiple stability where, where, where the mood of a person will go to, let's say here, a high depression, low mania state. This is a depressive state, right? And then that will jump to uh, what they call here, high mania, high depression, a mixed state, right? Well, they will jump to here, a high mania, low depression. That's a manic episode. And their mood will remain there unless bumped by other disturbances. Um, so you can see that we can conceptualize attractors there. Uh, there were many dynamical models, right? Um, of the, the, the of the mood dynamics in bipolar disorder. So it was it was a challenge to find the right one. Um, what I found here is um, this model, which captures the rate of change of manic symptoms. The, the, the depressive symptoms is analogous, right? But it's inspired in the Wilson-Cohen model of excitatory and inhibitory neurons, right? I did not it, it connect the behavior of neurons with the behavior of the symptoms, but uh, it might give a clue later in the future, right? But in any case, with a model like this, inspiring that where the parameters are explainable, like uh, in terms of what the psychologists use, mood regulation, uh, congruent stimuli processing, which is my, is if you are depressive, sad stimuli make you more depressed. Right? If you're manic, manic stimuli make you more manic and so on. Uh, or mood tolerance, I mean, these, uh, you, you, uh, you can, through simulations, recreate what scientists uh, empirically saw on mood dynamics, right? This is very interesting. It's called rapid cycling, right? It's a limit cycle or almost a limit cycle, right? Where the mood of a person is usually children uh, rapidly changes from depressive and mania and so on. Um, this is one partic particular interesting, right? People that are depressed when they take antidepressants their mood switches to mania right it doesn't go to let's say the normal or euthymic mood right it goes all the way from depression to mania right so uh this is a like it's, it's a form of initial validation right but it gives you the idea that this type of models might uh, have promise in for instance using it to teach people about their mood, about the effect of psychotherapy and so on. Another interesting thing that since we didn't have enough data to estimate these models, we, we resorted to go and, and analyze that model and analyze the stability of the euthymic equilibrium, right? the, the normal mood equilibrium. Right? And what we got was this result that that mood is asymptotically, globally asymptotically stable, provided that um, both the, in the manic and depressive drivers, right, we have large mood regulation on those, uh, on those domains, plus large mood tolerance, small stimuli processing, and this is higher, the regulation or the self-regulation abilities are higher than the coupling because there exists a coupling between the manic and depressive symptoms. Um, and this was published in Computational Social Systems and I hope is that we can build psychotherapy or uh, psychoeducation uh, applications based on models like this. Uh, all right, finally, uh, in early childhood education, I think I explained it uh, in this early example, uh, it's very important to uh, provide quality of early childhood education, especially since these first years of age are very, very critical, right? We see here that the window 
for synaptic formations, in particular for the part of the brain that determines language, it closed pretty rapidly after five years old. Right. Um, and scientists have, on, have found that the speech that is directed to the kid in reciprocal interactions, that's particularly important, right? Rather than just overheard speech. So what we had there is um, my collaborators, they, they had um, this very interesting data set of first person video uh, of 13 hours that were completely labeled, that means transcribed. Um, and what, uh, what I wanted to do is see if we can detect that child-directed speech, right? Through facial features, psychoacoustic features, um, uh, and later use automatic speech recognition to transcribe it. Um, so I, I, I trained this recursive neural network uh, bidirectional long short-term memory to with, with all these features, right? Uh, to try to detect these instances of reciprocal interactions between teachers and children and between uh, a teacher and a child and a child with other kids in the classroom. Right? So this, this little table here is just how accurate our results were in terms of counting words, counting different words, counting how many sentences or utterances. Um, we have so far improved those results with other models. Um, and the hope is that we can use something like this in a more network or a more longitudinal study where we have more classrooms. The issue there is that um, video recordings uh, are invasive, right? And not many people bought in. We, we, we need to get consent from parents and so on, right? So we, uh, okay, we, we tested using that data. We validated uh, here, this Bluetooth beacons that you see here uh, that are in this little pouch with the voice recorder that kids wore in the classrooms. And with that, we are collecting data now in 30 classrooms twice per week for a full year with the hope that we'll be able to draw a network like this where we can understand how this language resources, how kids interact amongst each other is distributed, right? If there are kids that are isolated from the system, this is from one classroom, right? Um, so this is uh, hopefully coming soon, uh, the, the final results uh, uh, of this, um, project, right? We will use dynamic variation networks to get uh, language complexity and engagement. And the hope is that using, for instance, um, trajectories of interaction between the teacher and the child, we can do inverse reinforcement learning and try to see if we can train an autonomous agent that will mimic the teacher's behavior, right? And later on, for instance, now that we have this foundational models like GPT, chat GPT, and so on, uh, how can we modulate those models so they can engage in meaningful uh, and powerful conversations, right? With the, that, that will improve the kids' language development, right? Of course, right? That all has all the ethical considerations that we cannot shy away. So, in conclusion, uh, I went over through some of the steps on closing the loop on modeling, analysis, and control, and finally sensing identification. This was later. Um, so, um, some of the next steps that I will be engaged in is, uh, as I mentioned, modeling is a big challenge in these settings, right? So, we need a general enough model that will capture. Um, the dynamics, right? And sometimes this multimodal where we have video language, we have wearable sensors like this comes from multiple domains that are hard to um, map or embed in a single space, right? So we could use uh, uh, very general metric spaces, right? Which are spaces where you can measure distance. There's no origin, right? But you can at least measure distances. Uh, and draw trajectories there with the hope that we can uh, model the systems 
and then think about how do we um, make analysis like stability, controllability, observability, and so on, right? Where we can conceptualize these as mappings from this complicated space to this uh, easier space, right? So you can see, for instance, in, in my uh, dissertation that's hopefully going to be published uh, in a journal soon, uh, we conceptualize a Lyapunov function, like a stability preserving mapping. Uh, so um, where we can map the input output stability of this system in a very abstract metric space and make conclusions based on this system that could be in a norm space. Um, uh, with the hope that we can use it later on for uh, this topic, uh, understanding equity in the context of our optimality, stability, and robustness. I mentioned digital twins for uh, cyber physical social systems are some of the things that I, I want to do for designing optimal interventions, right? And also this, this type of modeling and this type of uh, framework allows to use uh, applied category theory, for instance, where, we, where you where you use um, the tools in category theory to, uh, to try to map these properties from one system to another throughout the multiple levels we have in the social in the in a cyber physical social system. We have multiple stakeholders, we have multiple levels in time, multiple time domains, and so on, right? Um, so that, that's uh, a future, uh, some of the steps that I will be engaging in. Um, on terms of application, in terms of applications, right, I'll continue on equitable learning in the inclusive preschool classrooms with this time with real time tools, trying to learn from the sensors uh, and, and trying to uh, understand, improve our understanding and action on that, act on that understanding to build inclusive and equitable preschool classrooms. Um, continue in the mental health area, in particular with kids that have. Uh, uh, adverse childhood experiences that have chronic stress, their stress system is highly activated. So we can use, uh, for instance, music therapy that is responsive to their uh, biological signals um, to try to train them on how to regulate their emotions or their um, behavior. Uh, so, and, and finally continue with the cooperative sustainable development with an eye on resilience, right? Continue the finance, the microfinance work, right? So closing the loop has been, of course, very hard. Um, so collaborations are always open on, this, on, the, on the area of system identification, right? Uncertainty quantification is, a, is an open problem in the systems, uh, in particular, uh, with respect to the human subject research, right? And the experiment design, right? So the social scientists are uh, more used to the nomothetic approach where they, they, they account for different sources of uncertainty. So if they have, for instance, 30 classrooms, they have a different way of assigning the uncertainty throughout all those 30 classrooms, right? Whereas the standard system identification approaches that we use are ideographic. This, only, there's a single source or, or, or only a few sources of uncertainty. Um, on the design area, of course, I mentioned applied category theory, ethics and alignment, uh, uh, learning. I mean, how the systems learn is, is also a big challenge that we uh, um, that it's uh, uh, I'm open for collaborations there as well. Right? Validation and verification by safety and equity, respect to safety and equity, right? And uh, validating some of our sensors and actuators. Right? Um, I, I did not have enough data, for instance, to validate how well the speech recognition algorithm worked for different kids, right? Kids from diverse backgrounds, right? So that's something that uh, is certainly in the to-do list. Uh, um, and it's relevant to AI and robotics as I mentioned. So um, again, I, uh, I started this uh, talk with an eye on social interactions, right? And how they are important, right? Because I've witnessed um, the tremendous change that, uh, for instance, kids have when they are helped by 
a teacher, right, or a social worker or a psychologist, and, and you can see that throughout the domains, right? So uh, I, I view technology as transformative in uh, enhancing the reach of these uh, champions in this domain. So uh, okay, with that, thank you very much, and I'm open for questions. Any questions? Hello? Hello? Yeah. Yeah, um, I put a question in the chat, but um, I asked what changes, if any, would you like to see in the engineering curriculum so that students can be better prepared to discuss ethics and social systems and the like? Sure. Great question. Um, I think that uh, ethics is pervasive throughout everything we do, right? There's uh, usually discussions on doing things right or doing things wrong. Um, and that can be embedded in any, in any course in the curriculum in, in engineering. And um, there are experts uh, here in, in, in our university that um, are better prepared to answer that question with evidence, of course, right? Um, but um, from my previous readings, uh, it is more effective to teach ethics and engineering embedded in a technical classroom than to teach it like an like a standalone course. Right. So 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 we as engineers and students can connect the dots, which are often it's not easy. Right. Connect the dots and and, and understand the dynamics. Right. Be be aware of how where the ethical challenge arise and how to address them, right? Um, I think that that's a skill that we should have in as many courses as we can. Thank you. No, you're welcome. In the slide where you covered uh, depre depression and depressive thoughts, how did how is the double sigmoid derived in what implication does it have? Right. So the the uh, as I mentioned before, there, there is not a lot of dynamical models for mood disorders, right? Um, some of them were on oscillations, right? They weren't really connected to um, things that psychologists, for instance, can relate with, right? Uh, so uh, I tried to get a model that was as close as possible to that, right? So that's where I got this this model, right? The that features the balance between these two neuron populations, right? A population that excites a behavior and other ones that inhibits that behavior. So that is pervasive in neural dynamics. Um, so I, I I got inspired in that. By uh, so, so you see here this double sigmoid is part of that model, right? And this is the part that has to do with balancing that this excitatory behavior, right? So this, for instance, this HM NM here is the NM and ND are the coordinates for the euthymic or normal state, right? So we see that this term tries to maintain this close to zero, right? Whereas this unbalance, unbalances it, right? Here, this model wasn't, I mean, I did not simulate any, uh, or I simulated uh, external disturbances like the psychotherapy, right? But in the analysis, I did not consider any uh, uh, type of uh, disturbance, external disturbances, right? But that's something to consider later, right? Um, so yeah, that, that's the closest I could get, right? to just not using a simple oscilla oscillatory like a, a Van der Poel oscillator model and throw it there in the pressing mania, right? Uh, and instead try to get this model that was, that's somehow at least loosely connected to the brain dynamics, to neural dynamics, right? But can still have parameters that can map to this important uh, cons construct in psychology. Yeah. I don't know this kind of social system. 
You can mention that when that is a data and even the problem itself. Okay, there any like a benchmark problem in this kind of system that somehow easier to validate or somehow easier to compare with? Sure, the the you go back to this slide. Uh, the people uh, working in this field, computational social science, and, and you can Google, you can look at the uh, journals and publications there. And, uh, they are doing some, uh, some very good job of validating some of these models, right? The economics literature is the particular, the one that's more advanced because they, they have models that come from decades, right? That uh, the, the utility maximization, the right, rational agent, and so on. Um, those models have, I mean, they have been collecting data and validating those models uh, since a long time ago, right? So that's a good place to start. That's where, where I started too, right? I, try, I was trying to find, I mean, what's the best landing point in which I can use these tools in social systems? And I, I landed in economics, right? Economics and finance. And from there, yeah, you can branch out to uh, other domains. So this the, somehow implies that the challenging in this social system is that we don't even have enough data. Oh, you're not censored. You capture the data within the system. Exactly. There's, um, I would say that there's also a lack of theory, a lack of physics, as I said, right? Um, in, in, in the early childhood education domain, for instance, right? There's very few models of uh, how kids learn, uh, mathematical models of how kids learn through interactions, right? Um, so the hope is that uh, we can learn from mo models of human models, models that model human behavior in other domains and uh, generalize or apply them to this new domain and validate it with data, right? But as you've seen, uh, collecting data is not easy. It's um, hard, but uh, social scientists have a pretty, uh, pretty good methods to collect the data and collect it in an ethical way uh, that we can, uh, it could be a win-win scenario, right? They train, they, they develop better experiments and develop better models. And we also do the same with the better, better tools, right? With the better models we, we formulate. Oh, um, just do one more question in the chat and then we'll come up later. But the question in the chat is Do these dynamic models start with the data patterns or start with pre specified theory from the discipline, sociology, psychology, or is either possible? I think you've kind of answered that, but maybe somewhere else. Sure, yeah. Um, so I, I've seen it both ways, right? And uh, certainly for the early childhood education, uh, uh, since we don't have a very well ground theoretical grounding there to build a dynamical model uh, from theory, uh, these these models that uh, I'm trying to come up are mostly data driven, by right? data driven with some from some knowledge from economics and psychology. Uh, whereas in uh, economics, um, uh, yeah, the, this portfolio or uh, portfolio maximization, it's it's been there since the 60s at least. Um, and uh, in, the, in terms of the bipolar disorder, uh, that was the hardest one to get, right? Because all you get, all you have, or the most informative piece of information was description of trajectories doing in the text, right? In the text, uh, you will find that, yeah, people that take antidepressives and go from depression to mania. Okay, that's that's uh, that's how do they diagnose bipolar disorder, right? And how to translate that text into a dynamical system was a big effort, right? It helped out that uh, we can see in very very broad aspects, as detailed here, uh, and and as dynamical systems as sets of trajectories, right? It, independent of how we choose to formulate how these trajectories were generated, 
whether that's a differential equation, a partial differential, et cetera. I mean, dynamical sets are sets of trajectories, right? Uh, uh, as I said, uh, so this approach was espoused by Jan Williams. Uh, he's a big name uh, in terms of uh, dissipativity uh, of systems. Um, so I find that that framework very powerful when trying to model systems that we don't have theory, but we just have trajectories, right? So I know some of you have more questions, but it's going to be about 430. So I think my, my only comment is I, I love the fact that you gave this overview of all the things that you think about. Uh, but next year, I'm going to invite you back to pick one of them. Yeah, yeah, sure. And give us get us over the head of all the math and see how it really works. Right, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Go but, uh, well, let's thank our speaker for fascinating talk. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to give a brief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, overall, but, yeah, yeah. You can see people really want to work because, you know, even me, like I models with no motivation. It's just your parameters you can put some data. And then you're trying to apply these really high powerful math tools in my I'm a little skeptical myself whether the uh, quality of the model is the uh, power of the math tool. But, but you know, hey, so next, no, year, I, next year, next year, it's next year. I'll yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. prepare this talk on behavioral uh, approach. Pick one up. Database. Okay. Well, thank you so much, and welcome to Michigan. Oh, thank you. This guy had a question. I noticed a turn 